This is KSL Sunday Edition with Boyd Matheson. Welcome to Sunday Edition. I am Boyd Matheson. Each Sunday we attempt to divide the rage from the reason, elevate the conversation, connect the dots, and make the news make sense. We have conversations with great thinkers, great leaders, and great people making a difference. We talk politics so we can discuss society, and we explore society so we can discuss principles and the people in America who live them. We bring the best and brightest to Utah, and we send the Utah model to our nation's capital and beyond. Well, this weekend, the 17 million members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are gathering. Thousands in Salt Lake City and millions more tuning in to digital devices all around the world. They're all gathering to hear messages from their leaders at the Faith's annual General Conference. One of those leaders is President Jeffrey R. Holland, acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Now, it has been said that ideas go booming through the world like cannons. Thoughts are mightier than armies, and principles have achieved more victories than horsemen or chariots. So, inspiring ideas, transformational thoughts, and powerful principles. Those are exactly what the wordsmith of our time, Jeffrey R. Holland, has shaped, crafted, and sent out into the world for nearly 30 years. I sat down with President Holland in his office and asked him to reflect on lessons from his 30 years as a special witness of Jesus Christ to all the world. 30 years in a minute. So much is, uh, has been the same, uh, Boyd, and, and so much has been different. The gospel's still the same. My uh, message to the public is still the same. Uh, my private feelings of inadequacy are still the same. I think when I was called and the wrestle that I had, I just, I struggled. Uh, for the first two years, I apologized to everybody that I had this calling. I'd, I'd call people in off the street. I, I'd talk to the newspaper boy. I'd, I'd apologize uh, to everyone. I finally was told to stop apologizing and get to work. Uh, so I really wrestled with inadequacy uh, when I began. And I, and I had the impression then that I'd match that feeling with the feeling of so many uh, out uh, in, in life and uh, their struggles with, in my case, feeling inadequate, but, but their loneliness or their uh, difficulty, the, uh, the, uh, the sadness that might come, the tragedy to a family, the, uh, you know, I've spoken on mental uh, illness, uh, I just thought, well, maybe my mission is to, to talk about hope, to extend a hand to uh, those who don't think there's any hand to be extended. The hand can be extended, but the, but the, the rules uh, can't be broken. So we have to juggle discipline and what the Lord has said and what he's asked us to do uh, versus just a wide open uh, loving heart and and uh, and extended blessing. We will just try to do both. I I've tried to do both. I wasn't going to be uh, Bruce R. McConkie or James E. Talmage. Uh, there were a lot of things I I couldn't do, but maybe I could lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen feeble knees. Or so I've tried to do that. Yeah, you've had it especially over the last year uh, an added measure of of earned empathy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what have you learned in that process? M more humility uh, in a year or a couple of years than I have had in my whole life. I suppose that means I'm supposed to have had it. I'm supposed to have been humble. But I, I've learned to, uh, to yield and to understand that there are all kinds of things in our life we can't control and that uh, we need to just give over to God. And I, I've taught that all my life. I haven't always needed to do it. Uh, I've been a little too independent, a little too self-sufficient, I suppose. But now with neuropathy, I can't walk uh, very uh, gracefully at least. Uh, and with uh, kidney failure, I have to do much that I do in between dialysis sessions, so my life is very different than it used to be, and I've, uh, I've been required to accept that. Uh, it's the way life is going to be. Um, I've, I've taught that you hit the pitch that's thrown to you, 
Now suddenly I am not a pitcher, I'm a batter. And, and I have to hit um, what, I've, uh, what I've been given. So we'll, we'll make it do. We'll try to have faith and uh, go as far as we can go for as long as we can go. So you have been a, uh, a student of words and a lot of the great wordsmiths uh, throughout history and have become a, a wordsmith for the word. <laughs> uh, but tell us about what you have learned from the philosophers, the great writers, the great thinkers, and how that has influenced your ministry as an apostle. My mother encouraged me to go to the library. We, I had a library card uh, in our little uh, public library in St. George. and. I started going in in uh, kindergarten, and uh, I guess I've been figuratively or literally uh, in the library ever since. Uh, what I've learned is certainly has become part of me. The the great moral messages of uh, of the past, I think, uh, something of my has become something of my ministry to lace a little here or lace a little there in a gospel sermon uh, with uh, something I've read in, in, in uh, the great literature of the world. Interestingly enough, I did a lot of that when I began. I do less and less of that now. I am more married to the scriptures now. Probably, probably to the young people sound uh, a little more fuddy-duddy, but, uh, but my, the, all of the magic and marvel and uh, wonder of the Word now uh, comes to me from the Word. And uh, I find myself, not totally, but, uh, but nearly, nearly exclusively uh, uh, teaching out of the Scriptures and sermons now. And I'm not much inserted from, uh, from uh, Winston Churchill anymore <laughs> or, uh, or people that I love. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot of people, I, I can think of about 17 million around the world and uh, probably a million after that that uh, would refer to you as uh, the wordsmith's wordsmith well, thank uh, you. to go to. And uh, in fact, I think there was one social media meme that said uh, only President Holland could light a fire by rubbing two ice cubes together <laughs> if they were words. Well, <laughs> that's kinder than whoever that was needed to be. When we come back, we'll continue my conversation with Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and get his perspective on interfaith dialogue, culture versus doctrine, holding on and letting go in a rapidly changing world, and perspective on his apostolic colleagues. All when Sunday edition continues on KSL 5 TV. Welcome back to Sunday Edition. Let's pick up with more of my conversation with President Jeffrey R. Holland, Acting President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Take a look. Well, you've, you've been a part of some really important interfaith conversations. That's also um, been um, a part of your ministry. Uh, why has that been so important? I, don't, I think that probably started in my BYU years. I've had long, long years with the Jewish community, primarily, I think, because of building the, the BYU Jerusalem Center. And uh, I have all the scar tissue to show for that. Uh, and, uh, but it was there that I became friends with, with uh, a, a lot of uh, Jewish voices in, in uh, the Holy Land and, and gathered some there. At the same time, we, uh, we met uh, some very, very fine Palestinians uh, who represented part of the Arabic uh, world in the Middle East, and and I got a better understanding, a much better understanding of of uh, their issues and the things they hoped for. So that's probably where it began, and uh, I've just continued it, and I've enjoyed it, and been a better person by it. I think yeah. to learn from them. Yeah, no question about that. Um, you've uh, you're in a very unique. Uh, Perch and, and place right now in your ministry. You've had extraordinary leaders and apostles that have gone before you. Yeah. Uh, now you can look down to the members of the quorum you lead as acting yeah. president of the quorum of the twelve apostles. Give us something you've learned from those who've gone before, and then we'll get some perspective about those you're with now. Oh, it has been my privilege, a privilege I never could have imagined, 
never could have guessed, a little kid running around in Washington County. It's been my privilege to sit at the feet of and, and, and shoulder to shoulder with the finest men on the face of the planet. Their kindness, their example, their uh, patience, uh, their humor, their uh, bold, uh, solid backbone and square shoulders, all of that, I've, man after man and season after season, I've been able to, to enjoy and to, and to feel and to be moved by. Uh, they have been so good to me and uh, I still feel it. I get a little emotional here just to say that much to you about what these, what, uh, what these men have meant to me for 35 years nearly. So I, I miss them and admire them and praise them. And now I, uh, I have the same privilege with a much younger group coming along and uh, I love and admire them in the same way who have the same qualities and affect me the same way. Well, you've spent uh, your ministry uh, bringing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints out of obscurity. You've been part of that. Uh, what is it that you've had to hold on fiercely to and what have you had to let go of as, the, as things change and as things evolve and grow? That is part of the ongoing issue that we face every day of our lives. We have to define <clears throat> and keep redefining or keep seeking or keep drawing the boundary on what is gospel truth and what is culture. Uh, culture with a capital C. It could be anybody's culture, but it's something that's not um, cut in stone. It's not uh, in those tablets that Moses came down the hillside with. If those lines start to bump up against each other about what's a commandment and what is only, again I say, what is only culture, uh, and, we, and we've had to decide where do you yield and where don't you yield. Everything that we could offer and offer genuinely and with uh, heaven's support, uh, our very calling, our very, th this chair, this office, uh, means that I can't, I'm not free to offer what uh, Christ would not uh, say we could. So that's a day and night, uh, that's a day and night exercise uh, to try to decide where do we yield and where don't we, what can we offer and what can't we offer. Well, let's conclude with uh, really the essence of the essence of your role uh, as an apostle. You've traveled the world and you've uh, declared your, your witness. Um, what would you on this uh, general conference weekend where uh, a large number are gathering here in Salt Lake City, but the vast majority of the members are gathering around cell phones and yeah. digital devices around the world. Uh, what would you have them think and know uh, about the role of an apostle? The ultimate role, the essential role, uh, the focused and featured role of an apostle is to declare that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, we are called to be special witnesses of his name in all the world. And we're going to all the world. We have 35,000 congregations and we have some kind of presence in, I don't know, 180 nations. Uh, we teach the gospel in over 90 languages. Book of Mormon published in more than that. So we are going to all the world with that singular message that Jesus is the Christ. That this church is his church, that we are doing God's work. We're children of the living God and uh, it is His work and His glory uh, and His power that allows us to do what we're doing now and will allow us to do what we do in the future, including 
saving the world. Uh, that's no small task, Boyd. No small task indeed. Stay with us. My conversation with Relief Society General President Camille Ann Johnson is up next on Sunday Edition. Welcome back to Sunday Edition. Camille N. Johnson is the General Relief Society President for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She's a world religious leader of one of the oldest and largest women's organizations on the planet. I sat down with President Johnson in her office. Here's our conversation. Take a look. There's something about gathering. Uh, and while there are many that are gathering here in Salt Lake City, Utah, the vast majority of the 8 million or so uh, women of the church are gathering around computer screens yeah. and digital devices, but what does it mean for the women of the world to gather? It is wonderful to gather, you're right. And I see in my mind's eye, women in their homes gathered around uh, perhaps a computer or television screen, or maybe they've gathered to a church house where they can watch General Conference. Uh, what a glorious opportunity it is to be with the saints, but most importantly for us to hear from prophets, seers, and revelators. They will give us the counsel, direction, and encouragement we need to charge forward through these challenging times. It's such a powerful thing, and uh, as a world religious leader, you get to see these women in their homes, in their communities. Uh, I, I always call it the any given Sunday yeah. strategy, but there are women, uh, hundreds of thousands of women leading in local congregations, in local communities. Yes. Uh, there's no other organization anywhere in the world that can say on any given Sunday, they have hundreds of thousands of women leading, influencing, yeah. having impact and making a difference. Yeah. On any given Sunday, we would have hundreds of thousands of women, Relief Society presidents and counselors and secretaries, and their counterparts serving in the young women and the primary. All of those sisters, of course, are part of the Relief Society. Even those that have been dispatched to serve for a time in young women in primary, they're all part of the Relief Society. And those sisters who have been called have been set apart and been given priesthood authority to fulfill their responsibilities. What a glorious privilege that is that we have as women to be blessed by the authority given to us by someone with keys to conduct the work of the Lord. It's marvelous. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. Uh, and you've seen that applied not only in church houses uh, and in ministering, uh, but to major efforts uh, for nutrition and uh, for, for women. Uh, give us a, a sense of that part of uh, your responsibility and yeah. your interconnectedness with the women of the world. Yeah, well, our Relief Society sisters are organized in 30,000 congregations around the world to address the needs of the brothers and sisters, not only in their congregations, but also in their communities. I have the privilege, uh, because of my present responsibilities, to assess the needs of our brothers and sisters around the world on a global basis. But importantly, the way we address the needs of the one is one by one. And so our sisters can feel confident that they are part of our global movement, the global initiative to address the needs of women and children when they take care of the people within their sphere of influence, their own children, their nieces and nephews, their elderly parents, perhaps the honorary neighbor across the street. That's part of our effort. And when we minister to and care for the needs of the people closest to us, we are part of this global effort to bring the Savior's relief to our sisters and brothers everywhere. Yeah, that has been a, a theme of your time as uh, the general president of the Relief mm -hmm. Society is finding that relief yeah. uh, and giving that relief, ministering in the way the yeah. Savior did. Uh, as you've gone around and as you've interacted with the women of the church all around the world, uh, and as you've heard reports from what they're doing in their local communities, uh, what has surprised you the mm. most as you've watched the, this work continue to move forward? I don't know if it was a surprise, but a confirmation of what I thought, what I hoped and believed was true. And that is that the women of the church and all of us 
will find the relief of our Savior Jesus Christ when we look outside of ourselves and try to bring his relief to others. That's when those feelings of love from him and the relief that he offers come right back to us when we fulfill our responsibility to love God and love our neighbor. When we look outward, then we receive that relief right back. She recently addressed the European Union in Belgium as part of International Women's Day. She focused on the important subject of empowering women through freedom of religion and belief. I see the good that our sisters do when they come together to serve one another. And sometimes the projects are large scale, but more often it's a small group of women, usually a Relief Society congregation, that identify a need in their community and they tackle it. And that may be uh, contributing at a food bank. It may be serving breakfast, lunch, or dinner to uh, the homeless. Uh, those kinds of projects are where, where women come together, they really can affect change. We, we look at the needs on a global basis. We assess needs on a global basis, but we know that the way we address needs is one by one, just as the Savior did. That is, it's that uh, civil society at its best. Yes. And, uh, neighbor helping neighbor in need. Exactly. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned to uh, some of your counterparts and some of those in Parliament uh, there in Belgium uh, was this idea that, that government is good and has a role to play, that policy matters. Uh, but in the end, it really does come down to, to people. Government can't do it all. Policy yeah. can't do it all. Even diplomacy can't do it all. Right. Our well crafted policies and uh, well-penned legislative efforts don't satisfy all of our needs. We really do rely upon our good people everywhere to make up the difference, to take up the cause. And the way we would describe it as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is in fulfilling our responsibility to love God and love our neighbor and a covenant responsibility as we take the Savior's name upon us we seek to mourn with those that mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and lift those uh, that stand in need, to care for those in need. We know that global progress begins with women and children. If you want to affect change in communities and nations, you begin with supporting women and children. President Johnson, thank you for showing us what leadership looks like, what discipleship sounds like, uh, and what followers of Jesus act like. Thanks for joining Thank us you. today. Pleasure to be with you. A special thanks to President Jeffrey R. Holland, Acting President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and Camille N. Johnson, General Relief Society President in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, for joining us on this General Conference Special of Sunday Edition. I'm Boyd Matheson. Thanks for joining us. And as always, as you go out into the world, make sure you see something that inspires, say something that uplifts, and do something that makes a difference. Music in the Spoken Word is next.